I speak to the man who lives in London himself and who's seen it all uh, right from the start. Dele Ogun joins us now. He's a legal practitioner and also foreign affairs uh, analyst and commentator. Dele, thank you so much for uh, being here on, on the show. And it's been six years. Your thoughts on uh, Britain leaving the European Union. Has this been a wonderful or delightful divorce at the end of the day? Uh, not, not yet as far as the British people are concerned. And, and the reason for that is this. Uh, what they were promised were economic benefits of Brexit. And the reverse, of course, has been the case. Uh, the economic impacts uh, so far have been uh, negative. Uh, what they have achieved, which is intangibles, which the people cannot see, uh, if you remember the slogan, take back control, uh, they've achieved that uh, because the primary objective was to take back control of the borders, uh, which uh, now they're in a position where they're able to sit back and cherry pick uh, from Europe as to who they're going to let in. So they focus very much on the, the highly skilled migrants and they've been able to block out uh, the lower skilled uh, migrants, which is why they have the crisis on the economic front, the farm hands and laborers that they uh, needed or used to have, those ones have been shut out, whilst their focus has been uh, the high end uh, immigrants. So of course the the ordinary people of Britain can't see uh, that kind of intangible uh, benefit. Uh, all they see is the very tangible adverse effects uh, as far as the economy is concerned in terms of uh, pricing, cost of living, uh, etc. The other key benefit, uh, which again the people cannot see, uh, relates to our continent, Africa. Um, we often lose sight of the African dimension of the Brexit argument, uh, because uh, with Brexit, um, uh, Britain is, and this is part of the global Britain agenda, uh, has been able to take a firmer hold as far as the relationship with Africa is concerned. Uh, imagine if they were still uh, within Europe, uh, they would not be able to gorge themselves on the African opportunities all by themselves. They would have to share it one way or the other. Um, since Brexit, uh, what you see, or certainly what I see, is a trend whereby the other Europeans are being squeezed out. I mean, the Germans were squeezed out after the First and Second World War. Uh, the, uh, if you look at Rwanda, uh, Rwanda was first a German colony. Uh, before it passed to Belgium as part of the uh, Second World War uh, punishment of Germany, whereby it lost its colonies. And guess what? Rwanda now is in the British Commonwealth. So you see how the British hold on African territories uh, has been growing. And what I observe is a slow push on France uh, to push them out of the African market because the long-term agenda is the our continent uh, will be um, exclusively British. That's certainly what I see. Uh, they'll deny it, but uh, if you follow the trend lines, uh, you will see that. The other benefit, look at Ukraine. Uh, if Britain was still part of the European Union, um, the uh, Ukraine um, refugees would not have to be uh, granted uh, special permission uh, to enter Britain. Uh, Britain will probably be the very first country that they will have been heading to. But because the Brexit walls were erected, um, it now depends upon the largesse uh, of the British government. So these are the intangible benefits uh, of Brexit, which um, the ordinary people uh, cannot see. And the reason for their disappointment is that what they were promised was a better standard of living uh, because all the immigrants, it was said, were well, what was um, uh, uh, driving prices down in terms of labour costs, etc. Uh, now that's proven not to be the case. Well, I, I do understand, you know, how the opinion can be divided. Um, you talk about the intangible benefits, but to 
uh, at the end of the day, it's, you know, how this impacts on people. And then you have the immigration uh, crisis um, with the plan with Rwanda that has been widely criticized. You still have, you know, the fisheries row, the border with Northern Ireland and so on. So people's lives really haven't been impacted by Brexit. Well, that's correct. I mean, let, let's remind ourselves about the history of the European Union project. The project, the early thinking about the project started in the aftermath of the First World War. Uh, as early as 1923 is when the initial steps by the Europeans uh, were being taken uh, towards a, a European Union. Now, the British uh, sat by the side. They were busy uh, locking us, uh, let's bring it home. Uh, remember the 1914 amalgamation, uh, as far as Nigeria is concerned, political union was good for Africa. And so they were creating political unions in, in East Africa, in South Africa, and of course, in our Nigerian space. Roll forward. The very first attempts by the British to join the European Union project uh, was 1961, uh, a year after our uh, grants of independence. Uh, they were rejected at that point. They tried again in 1967. A again, the French blocked their application. Again, look at the timeline, 1967, that's when uh, Biafras were trying to get out of political union and Britain was trying to join uh, political union in Europe. Uh, and then they applied uh, again, at the what will have been towards the end of the Biafran War, 1969, uh, and that's when they finally were uh, allowed in in 1973. So there they are now, part of the political union, uh, and they're in there until uh, we then get our Brexit challenge in uh, 20, 2016. Now. Uh, and, and they don't actually leave until 31st of January uh, 2020. Now, in that timeline between 1973 and 2020, obviously relationships have inter, intertwined, intermingled, and divorce in those circumstances is a very protracted process. There will be a lot of en entanglements. It's not easy to just simply shut down and walk out. They've been more successful than others uh, simply because Britain is a powerful, uh, rich country. Other smaller countries who wanted to leave uh, would never be allowed to leave. It would be more like a, Brex, uh, a Biafra situation. You cannot leave the club because the concern was that if one leaves, it sets a domino effect uh, and others will be inclined to exercise uh, their own or claim their own sovereignty back as well. Britain, by virtue of its power and by virtue of its wealth, has been able to shove two fingers up, if you like, at the rest of the European community. But there will be a price to pay, and the price is still unfolding. Uh, we saw it in the Rwanda scenario where uh, Preeti Patel and the UK courts, the uh, House, uh, the High Courts, the Court of Appeal, and indeed the Supreme Court had blessed uh, the um, Home Secretary's uh, policy of deporting uh, peop uh, applicants uh, to Rwanda is almost a throwback to colonization. That, uh, you know, this is how Australia was created, if you remember. The unwanted convicts were all shipped off to Australia. So Rwanda has become that dumping ground. But it's the European Union who stepped in, the European Court of Justice that stepped in and said, <laughs> oh, no, you don't. Uh, the world doesn't work that way. So there have been benefits. There are still complications. Uh, they will always be part of Europe, uh, whether they like it or not. Um, but um, they are, uh, there are lessons to be learned, uh, for, particularly for our people, uh, in terms of the control of borders. We've got a border crisis at the moment with all the terrorists creeping in right, left and centre. In fact, not even creeping in, just pouring in. This is what is sourced for the goose should be sourced for the gander. If border control is important for Britain, uh, border control should be important for Nigerians for the very same reasons, uh, security of life and property. We never get enough time to speak to you, Dilly. Thank you so much for speaking with us uh, this afternoon. Have to go back to you on uh, the benefits and, of course, the uh, losses of uh, Brexit. Thank you. Uh, thank you.